It is 11 a.m. here in London. It's 6 a.m. in New York. This is World One. In the hour here in the U.K., where London's Metropolitan Police say they have arrested 1,047 people in connection with the riots, violence, and looting that have slept, swept through the capital. More than 580 have been charged. Most of them are accused of stealing. But police are also dealing with murder. In just the last few hours, they've made a new arrest. A 22-year-old male is in custody for the murder of this man. 68-year-old Richard Mannington Bowes was trying to stamp out a fire on Monday when rioters turned on him. He fell into a coma and died late Thursday night. Prime Minister David Cameron is vowing that anyone convicted in the riots can expect to go to prison. He says 16,000 officers will patrol the streets of London this weekend to stop more violence breaking out. Now, courts in London have been holding sessions throughout the night, hearing the charges against many of those arrested over the recent days. Ewan McMillan is a criminal defense solicitor in London. He says he's never known anything like it. Night courts are unprecedented uh, in this country. Um, the court last night that I was at sat. Uh, uh, Atika Schubert has been following this story. She joins us now with more on that. And Atika, they're saying they've never seen anything like it. It is unprecedented. How sustainable is it? Well, I mean, the question is, the prisons are already quite full. How are they going to be able to, where are they going to put all of these people? There's obviously a clear demand for justice, for making sure that these people are punished. And we are seeing the judges being very tough with sentencing, uh, trying to get some of these, some of these will basically be in there for, for months. We're here uh, in London. Thank you so much for that. It's been a head-spinning week on the markets, and it's entering the closing stretch, but there is little sign things will be any calmer next week. It's been a typically seesaw start to the day in Europe. These indices all fell as trading began, but they've turned sharply higher in the past couple hours. That's despite uh, official data out of France showing economic growth ground to a halt. The swings have stung regulators into action here in Europe. Authorities in four countries are temporarily banning short selling of certain stocks. To explain what that means and what difference it could actually make, CNN's Andrew Stevens joins us now from Hong Kong. And Nina DeSantis here in London. Let's uh, get the nuts and bolts of this from you, Nina. Yeah, let's start out by taking a look at exactly what's happened overnight, Manita. Four European governments have moved in to try and reduce that kind of market volatility you were just talking about by confronting speculators head on. And in doing so, these countries have decided now to ban short selling of financial stocks for the next 15 you know, days. Let's just cross over now to Andrew Stevens. And Andrew, we've seen this happening uh, in Hong Kong and Asia. Tell us about the impact that this could have there. Well, if you look at the, uh, the end of the day here on the markets, Manita, it looks like it's been a fairly quiet day. In fact, it has been quite a quiet day. Just in Andrew, and here, Nina, you know, we, we try to make sense of what's actually happening in the markets. And when we talk amongst ourselves, you know, there, there, there was a time when you can actually say, yeah, this happened because of this. And you would see a trend whether from region to region, but that doesn't seem to case. This doesn't seem to be the case as we're hearing from Andrew now. You know, Asia is not, uh, is, is taking its own route, but we still can't make sense of what's actually going to happen. Yeah, we should also talk about the fact that I spent uh, a day with a hedge fund earlier on this week when this market volatility began. And it was really interesting, Manita, because what the managers there were saying was that for every one human trade, there's at least 10 that are done by computers. All right, Nina DeSantis here in London, Andrew Stevens in Hong Kong. Thank you both so much. You are watching World One live from London. Has stepped up the pressure on other nations to join them in condemning the Syrian regime. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton says she no longer recognizes President Bashar al-Assad's legitimacy. The United and Nations says millions of people in Somalia need more help and they need it now. So far, the UN says it has only received half of the $2.5 billion it needs to get a grip on the famine spreading across East Africa. 12 million people are in danger of starvation in the Horn of Africa. The UN is appealing for millions of dollars to deal with that crisis, but it's just not getting enough. As Addison Cooper reports, what little help does arrive may be too late for the youngest at risk. There are so many kids in Mogadishu's Banadir Hospital, the new arrivals are being treated in the halls. Welcome back. You're watching World One. Here are some of the stories that we're talking about. His days of swindling investors out of billions of dollars may be behind him, but Bernie Madoff's clothes are still turning a quick buck. iPad cases made from the fraudster's old threads are the latest Wall Street craze. They're the brainchild of John Vaccaro, who snapped up Madoff's clothes at auction. But like any Madoff investment, buyers beware, because if you drop them, 
make and break. He lived the life of a fugitive on a two-year robbery spree. Now he has signed a multi-million dollar deal, dollar deal, movie deal from, the, from jail. Teenager Colton Harris, more known as the Barefoot Bandit, as he often committed his crimes without shoes, has sold the rights to his story to 20th Century Fox. The deal is worth more than a million dollars, but he won't see a cent. The money will go towards his $1.4 million restitution bill for his victims. Imagine being buried under 20 tons of garlic and onions. Well, that's what happened to a woman in China when a fully loaded truck skidded over and flipped over, spilling its cargo onto the street, then onto her. Rescuers dug her out, and amazingly, she walked away with only bruises. She probably needs a truckload of breath mints now. Parts of Europe are batting down the hatches as storms lash the continent. Meteorologist Petrum Javahari is at the World Weather Center with more on that. Hello, Petrum. Hello, Monita. Yes, uh, storms across much of uh, Western Europe. They're in Northwestern Europe, uh, producing a lot of rainfall the last couple days. And I was just looking Alrighty. into... Petrum, thank you very much. Yeah. We want to introduce you to the fastest aircraft ever built. Hypothetically speaking, it is the Falcon HTV-2 made by the U.S. military. Now, the unmanned aircraft uh, was successfully launched on the back of a rocket on Thursday from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Now, this is an animation showing how it should have looked. But about 20 minutes into the flight, the military research group tracking the aircraft said they'd lost contact with the vehicle. It was designed to fall into the ocean if there were any problems. Officials say the Falcon had crashed into the Pacific after reaching the desired speed and collecting nine minutes of data. Now, so how fast was the Falcon designed uh, to go? Well, up to 21,000 kilometers per hour. To give you some perspective of that, that's about 20 times the speed of sound. At that speed, you could fly from London to New York in roughly 16, 18 minutes. So what was the problem? Well, the program manager, Air Force Major Chris Schultz says, quote, we know how to boost the aircraft to near space. We know how to insert the aircraft into atmospheric hypersonic flight. We don't yet know how to achieve the desired control during the aerodynamic phase of flight. It's vexing, I bet. You're watching World One, live from London. British police have arrested a man in connection with the murder of a pensioner during the London riots. 68-year-old Richard Mannington Bowes was trying to stamp out a fire in the suburb of Ealing, which is in the western part of the capital, when he was set on by, by rioters. He fell into a coma and now, the died riots late. come at a time when the British government is looking at cutting police numbers to save money. But those plans are now coming under intense scrutiny. We want to cross live now to the heart of Westminster and join Oliver Wright. He's the Whitehall editor for the British newspaper, The Independent. Mr. Wright, thank you very much uh, for being with us. There has been a lot of criticism over the government's, uh, the coalition government's moves to cut the budgets of the police force right now. At this point, uh, it seems as though the prime minister saying he has no choice but to do so but what we're seeing on the streets now now many people are saying now is not the time to do it uh, exactly uh, the rioting may have stopped but uh, the recriminations have begun thank you very much for that we appreciate your time thank you. Well, we want to see what newspapers are saying about this. Here in the UK, there's a guest editorial in The Guardian from British comedian Russell Brand headlined Big Brother isn't watching you. It's, he goes on to say these young people have no sense of community because they haven't been given one. If we don't want our young people to tear apart our communities, then don't let people in power tear apart the values that hold our communities together. Also here in the UK, and an opinion piece in the Daily Telegraph with the headline, The Moral Decay of Our Society is as bad at the, at the top as the bottom. It goes on to say something has gone horribly wrong in Britain. If we are ever to confront the problem which have been exposed in the past week, it is essential to bear in mind that they do not only exist in inner city housing estates. And finally, the International Herald Tribune, which is the global edition of the New York Times, has the headline, Britain's Broken Windows. Uh, the guest editorial says, the flip side of Britain's famed politeness is a sort of hooliganism that appears at soccer matches and in town centers on weekend nights, an unfocused hostility that is usually fueled by alcohol. One issue, many views, and you can read all those articles in full at facebook.com slash W1CNN.
It is uh, recovering from a bloody past, but facing an uncertain future. Only months after Ivory Coast's civil war finally ended, the UN has tied a string of killings to President Alassane Ouattara's regime. The coast was torn apart when former President Bagba refused to step down after losing last year's election. The winner, Alassane Ouattara, took the office of president in April, but not before civil war claimed thousands of lives. CNN's Christian Purifoy joins us now from Lagos to talk about these uh, latest developments. And Christian, we had heard there from Alison Watara saying when he took office, saying that he would promise to make sure that no matter who, on whatever side of the political divide, will face justice if they have committed any of these crimes. But yet it seems as though, according to uh, locals and witnesses, the majority of the perpetrators have been rebels who've been supporting Alison Watara. Christian, thank you very much for that. Christian Purefoy there in Lagos. This is World One, live Welcome from London. There were some mixed fortunes for the world's top golfers as the final major of the year got going. High scores, low scores, and a tangle with a tree root. Alex Thomas, what's that about? You have to wait to find <laughs> out. I can say, though, that Steve Stricker equaled the lowest round in the history of major championship golf. Tiger Woods, though, was slumping to the fifth worst score he's ever had as a professional. The former best player on the planet has slumped to 30th in the world rankings, but he actually started well on the opening day of the US PGA Championship. He got to three under par after five holes, but then faded to a seven over round of 77. He's in serious danger of missing a cut in a major for only the third time in his career. Got off to a great start today. I was three under early comes because he was playing in Ireland. I understand. Did you um, ever watch Sesame Street when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Remember Bert and Ernie? Yes. My favorites, I have to say. Well, apparently, the two male puppets, Muppets as they're known, I just figured that out. Hi, you're watching World One live from London. We are approaching almost 7 a.m. in New York, almost noon in, uh, here in London, and uh, 8 p.m. in Tokyo. We want to take a look at what's trending on social media right now. At number three, Jane Elaine, the former singer with the uh, 80s metal band Warrant, has died. There is an outpouring of condolences across social media. The 47-year-old was best known for the hits uh, Cherry Pie and Heaven. There's no word yet on the cause of death. At number two, hacking group Anonymous says it is disowning calls to kill Facebook. This comes after a video was uploaded uh, to YouTube saying the group would kill Facebook on November the 5th to protect the freedom of information. Now official Twitter accounts for Anonymous have dismissed the claim saying we're supposed to fight for the users, not against them. And at number one, is social media to blame? Well, people are reacting to British Prime Minister's statement uh, in Parliament challenging social networking sites for their part in the London riots. David Cameron says the free flow of information can sometimes be a problem. He has summoned Facebook, Twitter and Blackberry for a meeting to discuss their role during the recent violence. Now they've been a, a staple of children's programming and Muppet rumors for decades. So how so now that the same sex marriage is legal in New York, will Sesame Street's Bert and Ernie express their true feelings for each other? Oh, Jeannie Most takes a look. Do Bert and Ernie have a secret? <laughs> New York. <laughs> I love them. You are watching World One live from London. I'm Monita Raj. Well, we thank you for joining us. We'll update you on our top stories at the top of the hour, followed by Piers Morgan. You're watching CNN. <laughs>